Well, it's good to be back with everybody in the class tonight. We're going to close out our study on uh, false philosophies tonight. It won't take very long in the beginning to do that. But I want to present the last one that has a very important impact on our society. Of course, all of these do. That's the reason I would look at them. I will pause here and say, interject this. You take everyone we've studied and you'll find that one way or the other, they undergird many other doctrines that arise from them, or they influence many other doctrines. So if you have a fundamental understanding of these philosophies, you'll know pretty much where a fellow's coming from, uh, whether he's in theology or whether he's uh, actually studying philosophy. Well, the last one of these I want to talk about is hedonism, H-E-D-O-N-I. Yes, you know, if I were to define that like the late brother Foy Wallace Jr. did premillennialism, I'd say hedom and ism, and ism means it ain't true. But there's a lot of folks that, that follow that. Um, it's the philosophy that began with a fellow by the name of Epicurus. Now, a lot of folks you'll hear today will talk about uh, Epicurean when it comes to various recipes or foods. And all that means in that case, they just like a lot of different things and they're seeking to please the palate. And that way it connects to the idea of hedonism. Really, to sum it up, I get in a lot of detail, it's the doctrine that pleasure is the soul good. Nothing else is good. Pleasure is the sole good. Now, the restricting, I guess that's the way to say it, the restricting factor in hedonism is undesirable effects. What do I mean by that? Undesirable effects. Well, one is to seek pleasure, and one is to live in pleasure, being careful not to so live to the extent that there will be pain to the body. That's the idea. Now, Brother Warren is usually, the late Brother Warren, remembered for his debate with the late Dr. Anthony Flew, 1976. But a couple of years after that, he de de debated Dr. Barnhart up at Denton, Texas, and it was on this very subject of hedonism. And the idea is whatever makes you feel pleasure, that's what you ought to seek after. Now, you think for a moment about that. I mean, I have to think too long, and you see where that carries you. There's uh, also, uh, to see how this is applied beyond just the fleshly appetites being gratified and that type of thing, there is also psychological hedonism. And that's the doctrine that, in fact, Men pursue pleasure and only pleasure in their lives. Now, if you go to a psychologist for help who has this kind of rudimentary understanding, uh, you'll see how much it affects his, his um, helping you with the, what he would call. And the same is true of psychiatrists. He holds anything like this view then he may tell you, well, the problem with you is, is that it's that religion that you have. It's hanging you up. And that's causing a great deal of mess up your mind because, you know, you'd like to get, commit fornication when you got ready to, but you've been programmed saying that's sin, that's wrong, you'll go to hell if you do. And that's what's got you all hung up. Now, if you want peace of mind, you just get rid of those things and uh, take that and apply it in every other way. 
you'll see why a lot of folks are in the mess that they're in. So all activities, according to this philosophy, are directed toward the acquisition of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Now, of course, you think about that for a minute, and I guess it was a great deal of pleasure for many of the Nazis put to death Jews in any horrible way they wanted to. I don't think it's very pleasurable for the Jews. And so the thing begins to fall down. Because what may be pleasurable to one person as that person seeks to bring about that pleasure to himself or herself, maybe bringing about a great deal of misery to somebody else. I don't think that those Hamas folks, though they may have considered it very pleasurable to kill as many Jews as they can, again, let me hasten to say, I don't mention the Jews as God has chosen people. They're subject to the gospel just like anybody else is today. But I do mention it because it's going on. It happens rather regularly. And you look at some of the chants that these demonstrators have, and obviously they don't care what happens to the other folks if it bring them a great deal of pleasure. So the thing begins to break down all the way around. All people who believe and respect the Bible, that is the teaching of the same, know that the pursuit of pleasure is not the purpose of life. Now, a philosophy of life that's worth anything has the right purpose to it. And I've indicated to all of us whether we can articulate it or not and have a philosophy of life, how we approach life, what we think we ought to do and ought not do, how we ought to deal with other people, and so on. There's no way you can read the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and not see that that's entwined in all of it. First commandment, I shall love God with all we have and are. What's the second? To love your neighbor as yourself. You, John will write in his letters, you can't say that you love God when you hate your neighbor. It's impossibility. So if we're going to learn to love God like the New Testament teaches and the Bible teaches we ought to, we have to learn how to love our neighbor. And you can't have the view that's espoused by Nazis and a whole host of other folks toward other people and be in God's faith. It's certainly true that God intends for his people to be happy as the Bible finds happiness. And that many things which we do and in which we engage are those things which bring genuine pleasure. I can add to this, uh, let me qualify it and say, genuine pleasure of the right kind. You know, I don't know what that is, but I don't study the Bible. God can tell me what the right kind is. And I can learn how the right, or what the right kind is and how to put it in practice and enjoy. If you pull a man off the street who is living according to the desires of the flesh, uses all kind of foul language and so much so that he never thinks about it, despises anything religious, makes light of anything religious, and all this kind of thing. He's not going to enjoy being in the worship period of the Lord's church. Uh, why is that the case? He's not qualified to. He doesn't know what's involved. Some of these people that talk so much about that they just want to make people feel better. There's, just, there's enough uh, beating people down around the ears because of their sins. Let's just try to find a little spark there and build them up. 
And that's all they, they do. A great many people have the idea, they, well, they know what sin is. I don't know that a lot of folks know what sin is. We may assume that. But if you read the Bible, which is given to us, especially the New Testament, which the church is to know and live, and part of that living is to preach it, well, you've got to be telling people what sin is. And a whole host of folks don't know. Is polygamy, a man having more than one wife at the same time, is that sin? Why, yes, it is. Well, a lot of folks in the world don't know that. They think it's all right. How are they going to find out? They got to be told it's sin. And you go down every one of the items in the works of the flesh that Paul lists in Galatians 5, concluding that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. People have to learn what specific sins are. And sometimes <laughs> that doesn't help. All my preaching career, there's been somebody or bodies in every congregation that tried to figure out, though they may be members of the church, at least outwardly for many years, if they had to be, just had to be in every worship period of the church. Now, if they've got that big a problem of gathering the saints, where everything's done according to the authority of the Lord here, and we have education of one another as we praise God for what we love and who our Father and our Savior. If you can't stomach that, what makes him think he's going to like heaven? You'll notice the writer of Hebrews talked about the spirits of just men made perfect. That's the reason I never get concerned about the state of affairs of the person who makes it to heaven. Because God is going to do everything to make up what a person ought to be to live in heaven. Here on earth, I can grow to develop. You know, we're going to enjoy heaven according to our ability to enjoy heaven. You think you'll enjoy heaven as much as the Apostle Paul? I think that we might very well see that our capacity to enjoy the glories, majesties, and honors of eternity in heaven is related to a great extent of how far we go here in molding our character into the likeness of Christ in the Lord's church, the family of God, as a child of God. Remember, we are studying to show ourselves approved unto God. So when we look at hedonism, we look at that which says, do as you please. And it does not consider the fact that you'll be inconsistent in trying to carry that thing out. It's just another way of being worldly. So we must know the word of God and we must live by it. Thus, we seek to do, as Paul commanded, to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Now, we've studied pragmatism, existentialism, atheism, agnosticism, evolution. We're going to continue some of that in our sermons on Sunday afternoon. And we just finished this brief comment or two on hedonism, which means Life is only good living if you just try to find all the pleasure there is. But the purpose to life is to meet your maker and to meet him justified in sight. That you might be made perfect and complete in a glorified, resurrected body fitted for heaven that our Lord even now has as he rules at the right hand of God. Now, I might say, since I'm going to leave that little study of... Um, false philosophy at this time. But if you have further questions about it, just let me know, and uh, we'll see what we can do to answer them. What I want to begin now, and I'm not quite sure how long we'll take to get it done, 
is the a study of the biblical doctrine of fellowship. The biblical doctrine of fellowship. Now, I've chosen, I guess we could start in different places, but I've chosen the first chapter of 1 John, the first epistle of the Apostle John in the first chapter. I want you to read it with me. And I'm going to be, I'll tell you now, zeroing in for our actual text that we'll pursue is verses 3 through 10, but I want to read all of it. If you would read with me, please. First John chapter 1, beginning verse 1. The apostle writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I want us to begin this study by simply posing the question, and more specifically about verses 3 through 10. Why did the Apostle John write this section? Now, a simple answer to this is because God wanted him to. <laughs> but why did he write it? Because you'll notice he's writing it to brethren that were to live faithful in their day and time. They were to take that word. They were to understand it. They were to make application to their own lives as to what they did and what they didn't do in their associations and so forth. So the question really is, is that what did, what did John intend his readers comprehend when they read these words? Well, I could only know what John intended by knowing the words he wrote because a word is a vehicle of thought or a sign of an idea. And I can only know the ideas of John or his thoughts by reading his words. Now, to understand the message of, of any text, certain questions of the kind I've just asked, why did John write it? And what did he intend for his peers to the recipients to understand that he wrote? We must learn to ask some questions. It helps focus our mind in on what's being said and not let us drift. I think one of the things that we do sometimes, we talk about, well, what's the best way to study the Bible? Give me some, well, there's no magic way. It, it all comes through the process God made for us to come to know anything. But what happens is, is that people read and if they're reading to themselves especially, 
their mind drifts. And they wake up about three verses down from where they were first drifting off and they don't know what they've read. They start back up again. Let me make this simple suggestion. Don't try to study so much at once. Now, if you're just reading, simply to be familiarized with the text and let it flow just like we did here. And I recommend that kind of reading. Read it as if you're trying to be John himself and write these things. Read it like there's an audience depending on you to understand the will of God, which means you need to know what commas and semicolons and periods are. Sometimes I hear people read and and if semicolons and colons and commas were little kids, they'd be guilty of all kinds of murder by running over them because they don't let them work as they need to work. So don't read too much unless you just familiarize yourself with the text. And still again, don't read too much. Think about it as you read. But then to get really get into a study of it, learn to ask these questions. And maybe you don't want to cut it. If there's like one paragraph, it may be four verses, it may be two verses, maybe six verses. Whatever it is, just study that little bit. It, it's over a period of days and weeks and months and years that you accumulate knowledge. You don't do it all in one day, and you don't do it hit or miss. So to understand the message of our text here in verses 3 through 10, we have to ask certain questions. And, you know, we must correctly answer those questions. Just any, any answer won't do. We want the correct answer. And now what I've said is true about anything. It's not just John. It's whatever you're studying, whatever scriptures you're studying. Also, before we get directly into the study of the text. We need to look at uh, some of the basic tenets of a spurious false doctrine of the time. And it's called Gnosticism. If you spell it in English, it would be capital G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, Gnosticism. Now, that's what the apostle is concerned about is the doctrine of the Gnostics. The brief study of this false doctrine, I think, here, because of what John's doing, is somewhat necessary because much of what the apostle writes pertains to the refutation of Gnosticism. Now, it would show its head much later on after the divine volume of clothes and after the first century. But, in fact, you can see a little of it showing up in what Paul has to say in the book of Colossians. But as to whether it had been called Gnosticism and the followers of it, the disciples of it, called Gnostics, at the time John wrote, I, I don't know. So many times... Uh, False doctrine comes along, it takes years to form and finally to reshow itself and then to make inroads and finally somebody gives it a name. So uh, you might keep that in mind concerning Gnostic if you want to go ahead and pursue this. But the term Gnostic, and we've run across it earlier in the word when we studied in uh, Gnosko, which is I know. But it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And this label was attached to those who claim for themselves superior knowledge. That's how it finally came to be attached to those who would believe the doctrines that caused them to be called Gnostic or to be, to be uh, of narcissism, not narcissism, Gnosticism. Now, there are two brands of Gnosticism that existed during at the time that uh, John wrote, 1 John. 
It's docetic, D-O-C-E-T-I-C. -E docetic, D-O-C-E-T-I-C. -E and Cerinthian, C-E-R-I-N-T-H-I-A-N. Cerinthian, C-E-R-I-N-T-H-I-A-N. So there are two kinds. Docetic and Cerinthian. Docetic Gnosticism rejected Christ's human nature. Just keep that in mind. Docetic Gnosticism rejected Christ's human nature. However, Cerinthian Gnosticism tried to separate the human part of Christ and they would call that human part Jesus from the spiritual aspect of him, which they call Christ. They advocated that Christ descended upon Jesus at his baptism and left him at his crucifixion. I suggest if you will think about that and then look at what John says, you'll see he's hitting both of them very hard in the very first chapter. It also lets you know why he writes like he does in the Gospel of John. Notice how much more meaning you get out of when he says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Now watch verse, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. Now, there's no Gnostic, Docetic, or Serenthian who can affirm that because it doesn't fit their doctrine. So that's important to keep that, that in mind. Now, another interesting thing is that Jews still impacted the church not like they did in the time that the scriptures were being revealed, and we need to understand that they continued, though, around the Roman Empire to exist, even though Jerusalem and Israel has been laid waste by the Romans in AD 70. There's no temple. All that's gone. But they hated Christ. Thus, they would be very supportive of docetic Gnosticism. And some of them actually buddied up with the Docetic Gnostics to help them get their view across. Because remember, the Docetic Gnosticism rejected Christ's human nature. And that suited the empire to be able to say such things. I guess it's very difficult, and you'd have to make a bit of a special study to see it, to understand all the crazy doctrines among the Jews, even while Christ walked this earth. And they still held different views. You don't have all of that brought out, because that's not the purpose of it, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they would come along and get all mixed up, with these heretics in the church that suited them. Now, you might see a little bit, just a little glimmer of how goofy some of the Jews had gotten when you look at Sergius Paulus, who's the deputy over Cyprus. You remember Bar-Jesus? He was a Jew. Yet he was not anybody who was doing his best to keep the law of Moses. He certainly wasn't a good Pharisee. And uh, he was more of a magician, <laughs> which most of them were. So you had this kind of thing going on all over the place. And the only way you're going to find out much about it is to engage in a particular study of those things, because the Bible is not interested in those particular matters. That's one reason here in 
Gospel of John, First, Second, Third John, um, that you don't have a name brought out that becomes very well known in the church uh, past the first century as far as what these doctrines were. So false teachers of the Corinthian heresy would have been glad also, as with the docetics, to drive any kind of wedge into the church it would help destroy him. He didn't mind doing any of that. You see a little bit of that, even at the demand of the hierarchy of Judaism in Jerusalem, to get Jesus crucified. They wanted the placard that Pontius Pilate had put up on Jesus' cross. Remember, they didn't like it because he said, king of the Jews in three languages. They want him to take it down and reword it and have put up there. He said he was king of the Jews. Because remember, they had declared very well, we have no king but Caesar. And that tells you how far they would go. And then to see in the travels of Paul among the Gentiles preaching the gospel, how far they would uh, go, different ones, to charge him with various things. Uh, you see seven sons of Sceva. These are all <laughs> old language vagabond Jews. They weren't much out for anything they could get. And so what do they do to the fortune-telling girl? Uh, those two things together. One of them, Paul cast out a demon, and so they come in and say, by Christ to whom Paul preaches, we want to cast him out. Well, the demon overcame them. And this girl caused Demetrius and all his crowd to rise up because they cast the demon out of her. Now, this shows you how far people were being just completely dishonest. Those who rose up, seven sons of Sceva, later on, or you've got the matter of the young lady, the damsel, who's possessed, who by divination was bringing fortune tellings, what it amounts to, bringing money in. And they were after what people are after today many times. Position, power, prestige, and the money's under all of it. Well, these Jews were glad to get all this kind of stuff going. Now, I think what we see is the great love God had for Jesus, the gospel, and his brethren in Christ when we go through these letters. We also see his hate, and we see his disdain for false doctrine. I don't know how you can read any of this and not clearly see those things. And it's a sad day today, and has been for many years, that many who think of themselves as children of God, who is so warped love, that it doesn't allow you to be bold in the proclamation of truth or expose error or call sin by what it is or to label the various kinds of sin, let people know you're sinners. Even though they'll say, well, all is sin to come show the glory of God. Well, what do you mean by sin? What is sin? What sins are you talking about? And when you look at gospel preachers, some of them can speak in such generalities, you, you don't know really uh, specifically what to do. And we assume that a lot of people understand things, which they don't. But the one thing I would have you notice, and we're not going to have time tonight to do it, you go back and read that chapter again before we get together next time. But the main thing I want you to notice is notice the love of the Apostle John for the Lord, for the truth, and for his brethren. And I want you to gauge that love, his definition of it, with what is passed off as love among the brethren or love of God today. 
You'd be surprised sometimes how all that came. I want to leave you with this concerning tonight's class. In view of the fact we read the first chapter, we're going to be zeroing in on verses 3 through 10. Every faithful child of God, as the Bible defines those terms, can be in fellowship with everyone who John can fellowship. Now let that sink in and think about it for a while. Every member of the church, as that term is used in the scriptures and defined, can be in fellowship. When we, we'll talk more specifically about the meaning of the word fellowship. Can be in fellowship with everybody that can be in fellowship with John. If a person cannot be in fellowship with John, or John would not fellowship that person, that person is not in fellowship with God. And we who are in fellowship with God could not fellowship somebody who is out of fellowship with God. Very important to understand that. There was a time when John walked this earth. And the church was there. He was writing part of the scripture. And he wrote plainly, we want you, we as the apostles, to know the fellowship we have with Christ. And that's written to me and to you. So that's one reason I want to begin this study, the Bible Doctrine Fellowship. Let's have a word of prayer before we close our lesson, please. Our holy and righteous Father, glory and honor and power be unto thee forever. We come hallowing thy name, praying that was here at Sunday. We thank thee for the time we've had together in the midst of a busy week, to be in fellowship in the study of thy word, and to bring various things to the, our minds about it, to understand better how we should study the Bible, the importance of it. Help us to understand thy word on all things, especially in this class, the biblical doctrine of fellowship. Be with the church at spring, strengthen every one of us to be as the Bible says we should be. May we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we love his brethren, love thee with all that we have, and all. Love our neighbors ourselves. Help us to know that love always leads us to obey the truth in all things. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.